Good afternoon and welcome to SPIS 2021 Investor Day focused on ESG. Today we've set up an agenda which hopefully will help you to know us better through the lens of ESG. We're going to talk about how our services contribute to the energy transition, how we measure this contribution, then we're going to present our CSR roadmap for 2025, and lastly we will present on how sustainability is embedded in our governance. This is going to be an interactive event, so feel free to ask your questions through the platform, and we will get to them in two Q&A sessions during the event. Your speakers today will be Gauthier Louet, Chairman and CEO, Liv de Klerk, Managing Director of SPI Netherlands, Olivier Domergue, Managing Director of SPI France, Marcus Holzke, Managing Director of SPI Deutschland und Central Europa, Isabelle Lambert, CSR Director, and Regine Stackelhaus, Independent Director and Chair of the CSR and Governance Committee of SPI's Boards of Directors, and Jérôme Vanov, Strategy, Development and M&A Director. So we hope you enjoy this event, and with that, I will now hand over to Mr. Gauthier Louet, Chairman and CEO of SPI. Yeah, good, um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to have you today. Thanks for the ones of you, the ones of you who have decided to, to attend in person, and thanks to the ones who are connected now uh, on per video conference. So, uh, a brief word of uh, introduction to sustainability uh, at SPI. Sustainability is at the core of our business. We do enable the energy transition to happen. It is our top internal priority, and we'll take you through our CSR roadmap, and it is embedded in our governance, obviously ensuring consistent and efficient implementation of our sustainability strategy. I keep saying it's a good time to be an electrical engineer, and as you see on this chart, electricity is at the heart of energy transition. The mix, the electrical mix, is moving a lot towards renewable energy and we'll see keeping focusing on, on low carbon energy with, with a nuclear electricity. We are a very important actor in all the field of transmission, distribution of energy number one in Germany, number one in Netherlands, and a very significant actor in France as well. And then all our customers today do focus on energy efficiency in all sectors of the economy, local authorities with a special focus on public transportation, um, all our private customers in the area of uh, building where they are seeking uh, fast improvement in energy efficiency, and we'll see our industrial customers as well. What doesn't get measured doesn't get managed. This is why since 2019, we're embarked on a journey using the brand new EU, European economy, European Union, sorry, taxonomy. We have uh, decided to try and, and measure our contribution to the green economy. This was the first measurement in 2019 where we came up with a figure of 35%. You will see today that we have reached 41%, but it's not the whole contribution to uh, uh, carbon reduction within SPI. And altogether, as you will, show in, you will see in the afternoon, we're looking at a uh, contribution of about 70% of what we do has a positive contribution to carbon reduction. And this is not the end of the journey, obviously. We see that this uh, part of our business tends to grow faster, and we have worked on our bottom-up uh, strategic plan with all our, our colleagues from, from the XCOM in the, in the previous uh, months. What we estimate is that uh, the share of our 
taxonomy line activities should reach about 50% in SPIS 2025 revenue compared to the 41% of 2020. We also mentioned, and we are going to show you today, what are our commitments towards our own uh, energy uh, carbon emissions. And clearly, uh, we are looking at our scope one and two. Together with our supply chain, we're looking at our, at our scope three. We're also looking at safety. It's been, it's been really embedded in, in space culture for, for very many years now. We still have too many accidents. We're looking at a, at a target of reducing the severe accident by half uh, by 2025. But I should not mention this word as a target. The only viable target is to be at zero severe accident. We need to work on, on our path and our, and our uh, trajectory to reach the only goal that really matters. And then we're working on gender diversity in an environment which is, uh, has been historically a very male environment, I must confess. We really work at, uh, at attracting women to our type of uh, business at all levels, uh, at uh, site level, project uh, engineers, but also at top levels because we need, uh, we need also role models to attract uh, young, young women to, to our jobs. So I'm very happy to have a role model with Liv, but it, it's not enough. And um, clearly we, we're looking at uh, increasing the share of women in senior management uh, by 25% uh, in, within five years from now. And to guarantee um, our commitment in terms of um, sustainability and, and CSR, we, we have really worked uh, with, with the board of SPI. I'm very pleased uh, to welcome today uh, Regine Starhaus, who is our chairwoman for uh, the CSR and governance committee. She will Thank you with all the safeguards we have put in place to, to guarantee uh, our commitment and our progress in this area. And with this, I will uh, hand over to our first speaker of the uh, afternoon, uh, Jérôme Vanov, who will take you through our strategy in this area. Thank you for your attention. I'll be back later for Q&A. Thank you, Gauthier, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, there is um, a very clear growing collective awareness uh, about necessary decarbonization, about necessary uh, transition uh, to, to a green path. And as evidenced by um, our 10 years old uh, annual report uh, cover page, this is absolutely not new to speed, this is absolutely not new to, um, to us. For, for a long time, uh, and especially as we are electricians, uh, as we are a pure player in, uh, in services to, uh, to energy, uh, SPI has been supporting its customers in uh, reducing energy consumptions, in developing low carbon uh, energies and, and systems. Climate change and uh, more generally uh, global warming uh, is one of the biggest challenges uh, of our times. So climate change mitigation means mandatory energy transition, means a mandatory uh, set of new rules for politicians, for the regulators, so as to allow decarbonization across the economy. As such, uh, the European Union and all uh, country members constituting European Union have set uh, new rules, including minus 55% of CO2 emission by 2030. And the objective is even uh, stronger by 2050, where carbon, uh, carbon neutrality should be, should be reached. In the meanwhile, um, global warming and, uh, and climate-related events already intensify, and populations, economic agents, must adapt to physical consequences and risks. A decarbonized economy and the, the energy transitions mean that the whole electricity chain must deeply 
and massively evolve so as to reach all the goals and the objectives as set by the, the, Union, the European Union. Sorry. Starting with the, the poor generation, where renewable energy will have to represent up to 65% of the total electricity production by uh, 2030. I recall that this has to be seen in light of uh, a status of 37% at the time we speak. This will have an obvious impact on the electrical grid, transmission and distribution networks that will have to adapt to the multiplicity of those new renewable sources for uh, electricity production. Regarding buildings, regarding industrial facilities, it's all about energy efficiency. And again, the European Union has set a new, a new goal with uh, an improvement of the energy efficiency by 32.5 percent by 2030 in comparison with the, the current performance already observed in 2007. Finally, about mobility, the objective is a reduction of 27 percent of the CO2 emissions for the entire mobility and transportation sector. These objectives, these goals set by the, the European Union are already evidenced by our customers and this across, across the, the world chain. Starting with utilities and, uh, and uh, energy, uh, energy provider, one key customer to us is EDF, obviously in France, we are making more than 200 million euro revenues with, with EDF. EDF will invest so as to double uh, in the, in the coming, uh, coming 10 years their renewable energy capacity from 30, 33 gigawatts up to 60 gigawatts by that, uh, by that term. It's the same with, with Total uh, Energy. Total Energy is again a, a key customer to, to SPI and for, and for years. Total Energy will have to reconsider its positioning, embarking on the decarbonization, obviously, of its entire organization. And with such, will invest quite massively so as to uh, target renewable energy production by 2030 up to 30 terawatt hour. We have seen that any changes, any modification on the power generation side systematically involves some adaptation for the, the, the electrical grid, the transmission and distribution network. Tenet is one key player, it's a leading uh, transmission service operator, a key customer to, to SPI in Germany as well as in the, in the Netherlands. Tenet will invest accordingly up to five, six billion per year so as to adapt uh, the current uh, footprint he is uh, operating. And we have on the, at the other hand, other uh, extent of the chain, all our clients who do operate some buildings, some industrial facilities, these clients will necessarily have to comply and to satisfy uh, low carbon emission uh, new rules. And in order to do so, they will necessarily invest it so as to modernize their building, so as to adapt their industrial uh, footprint. SPI is an enabler, is an enabler of the uh, energy transition for our customers and this across three pillars. Uh, my, my colleague Livre, Olivier and Marcus will uh, further uh, explain and, uh, and uh, present this afternoon what it is about. Three pillars starting with a shift in energy mix, enabling uh, the shift to a large scale decarbonized electricity production. Seen from SPI's position, it is all about uh, the connection of renewable energy uh, power plants on, uh, onto the electrical grid. Second pillar is about energy efficiency, enabling again the energy efficiency across buildings, across uh, infrastructure, public infrastructures, as well as uh, across industries. Finally, the third pillar is about mobility, enabling the shift to a, a sustainable uh, mobility. As for us, we talk about uh, uh, electrical uh, mobility, so uh, charging points for electrical vehicles, urban mobility, and of course, public uh, transportation. So we are proud to, 
to say that at SPI we are an enabler to the energy transition, but let's, let's give facts and figures to this, uh, to this statement. All the solution that SPI is currently providing to, to its clients account for circa 70% of our total revenues. This figure is derived from uh, an independent, the independent net environmental contribution organization. So meaning that more than two thirds of our revenues are uh, enabling our clients towards the energy transition. Out of which 41%, and uh, Isabel Lambert will, will further detail that, but 41% are, of our revenues are eligible to the very strict, very demanding European taxonomy as we already communicated on. Now, I am pleased to hand over to Liv, who will uh, uh, introduce you to the first pillar, shift in energy mix. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jerome. As, as Jerome just presented, the shift in energy mix, which makes up 23% of our revenue contribution in 2020, is a key pillar in the energy transition of our customers. So we will now demonstrate how SPI enables the shift to a large-scale decarbonized electricity production. Let's first talk about our technical expertise. We can approach this by the value chain. If you look at the value chain, where SPI's strength has always been that we boost the competences to act along the full life cycle of the assets, from the design phase over maintenance, installation, operation, um, we are at the heart of our customers and this also allows us to enable a long-standing relationship with our customers. With 30% of revenue contribu contribution, Transmission and distribution has always been at the heart of SPI and together with our big customers like EDF, Tenet, Amprium and ILIA. But over the past years, we've also positioned ourselves in the renewable energy production, together with big customers like Total, but also very much with a very diversified portfolio of regional and local customers. And at the same time, we have gradually gained experience to be ready once the hydrogen market will come to full potential. And we would now like to give you a deeper insight in the domains of low carbon electricity production, transmission and distribution and hydrogen. Thank you, Liv. So now if we take a look at the EU target in terms of reducing green gas emission, you know that the target is 55% from 1990 to 2030. And it's quite an ambitious challenge for two main reasons. On the one hand, because for the moment about 75% of all the energy in UE comes from oil, gas and coal. On the other hand, our EU GDP will keep on growing and consequently energy consumption will keep on growing too. And so to achieve this goal, changing our energy mix is key. And for that, EU relieves on two levels. On the one hand, the idea is to increase the production from renewable energy by 65% within 2030 in order to provide about 32% of all energy instead of 23% today. And in particular, the part of renewable energy in electricity generation should move from 37% today up to 58% in 2030. The second part is to increase the part of electricity among all the energy required from 21% to 25% within 2030. SPI is present on all low carbon electrical electricity sources, solar, wind, biomass, hydropower and nuclear as well. And as you can see, uh, within 2025, the growth in nuclear and hydro market will remain quite modest, lower than 5%, because to increase capacities in this field, you require new extended power units or dams. At the contrary, the market in uh, solar, biomass and wind will increase by 10 to 20% per year by 2025, because there will be thousands of local initiatives in all the SPI countries, empowered by local recovery plans. On this market, 
speed enacted, for example, to install wind turbines or solar panels, but also to cable activities while proposing some added value solution for grid connection, and Marcus will talk about that, and operation, including remote monitoring of the power production plants and substation, allowing to increase the productivity and ensure operational continuity between the various decentralized solutions. Now let's focus on a few examples of SPI contribution to the change in energy mix, beginning by offshore wind farm. Um, the story is the following in France. Our industry division created an entity dedicated to the marine uh, energy sector in 2019. That's two years ago. And as you maybe know, the first offshore wind farm in France managed by EDF Renewables is located at Saint-Nazaire and it is composed of 80 wind turbines of 6 megawatt each. And on this field, SPI won several contracts from the general uh, operator called General Electric, which are including, for example, the monitoring of the 80 wind turbines onshore. And for that, we installed 1,000 IoT connected to our SPI platform called FabLook, including warnings. And this captor will obviously be useful for the offshore maintenance in the second time. We also want the contract for the preservation of the 80 turbines. It means the period between the assembly onshore, which is done in 2020 and 2021, and the offshore installation in 2022. And obviously, in all this period, our IoT and digital platform will be very contributive in order to achieve the operation for preventive, curative, and predictive onshore maintenance for electrical topics like corrosion, for example. And we also want a market for the design and production of a high voltage test bench for the 80 turbines. And the uh, positive news is that the collaboration with the General Electric has now extended to the production of new test benches dedicated to a new range of uh, wind turbines, maybe you heard about, which are called Aliad X and which uh, unit power is 13 megawatts instead of six. And we finally want the installation of assembly of the onshore high voltage substation equipment, including commissioning. And this is a very positive adventure because the strong commitment of our teams generate new opportunities and new contracts we hope to win, it's not the case yet, such as offshore commissioning and maintenance on Saint-Nazaire field, but also a preservation contract, exactly the same for this time Aliad X program, 13 megawatts, on a project called Dogger Bank. This project is located in UK. It's a 2022-2025 project. And it includes this time not 80, but three times more, 276 wind turbines of 13 megawatt each. And we shall answer this bid in contribution with uh, Speed UK. Now, if you take another example, which is the offshore wind farm at Fécamp in France too, where Speed delivered the electrical and instrument and instrument um, installation for a GV between Saipem and Bouygues, which is working too for EDF renewables. This project this time addresses 71 wind turbines of 7 megawatt each, and this is really an example of a one speed approach because uh, in the first part of the bid. Our teams have capitalized on SPI oil and gas services, good relationships with SAIPEM in the oil industry. And on this contract, which is worth about 11 million for SPI, SPI OGS is in charge of engineering and procurement, while um, the industry division of SPI France is in charge of three major topics. Firstly, the onshore installation and cable works for the wind turbines including lighting, including CCTV, marinized low-voltage electrical cabinets, which are produced by SPI locally in Plumer, fiber optical patch panel or fire detection and mar marine safety radar. We also want the preservation maintenance contract between the installation, exactly the same, and the assembly onshore. 
and um, including assistance to offshore commissioning and also the installation and commissioning of the offshore high voltage substation. And on top of that, one of our subsidiaries called Spitepo, which is specialized on, on onshore high voltage transportation, want the bid to connect by underground cable from the shore to the existing 225,000 volt network in Le Havre at a distance of 32 kilometers. Now, if we move to the nuclear electricity production market, as you know, it's a 100% decarbonized energy available 24-7, where SP is a top three player since the construction of the first power plant in France in the 1970s. Ever since, SPI keeps on accompanying its main clients led by EDF through the Grand Carénage program, aiming at increasing the lifetime of the existing power plants while preparing the construction of new EPR power plants. And so I propose you to, say, to listen to David Guillon with the MD in charge of our French nuclear division. Spin Nucléaire est une entité euh, dédiée au nucléaire en France qui repose euh, sur euh, trois valeurs ajoutées fortes. Une parfaite connaissance des installations électronucléaires françaises et les usines amont et aval du cycle du combustible. Une parfaite maîtrise de quatre métiers que sont le génie électrique, le génie mécanique, le génie climatique et le génie nucléaire incluant la radioprotection dédiée à la filière nucléaire. Et enfin, un savoir-faire allant de la réalisation de nouvelles installations jusqu'au démantèlement, en passant par la maintenance et la modification des installations, le tout dans une démarche de digitalisation de notre savoir-faire. L'énergie nucléaire est une énergie de qualité, abondante, pilotable et décarbonée. L'énergie nucléaire fait partie du mix énergétique en complément de l'éolien et du photovoltaïque qui émettent également peu de CO2. Spin Nucléaire a su rester mobilisé auprès de ses clients, des opérateurs d'importance vitale, assurant ainsi la production et le transport d'une électricité décarbonée, élément stratégique en période de pandémie. Les perspectives pour Spin Nucléaire sont d'accompagner nos grands donneurs d'ordre que sont EDF, Ramato, Moranou, pour ne citer que les principaux. Pour EDF, c'est de poursuivre le programme dit de grand carénage qui touche principalement le parc 900 MW lors des visites décennales où Spin Nucléaire apporte son savoir-faire pour réaliser des travaux qui permettent à EDF de prolonger de 10 ans son parc actuel. Et le deuxième axe sera d'accompagner également EDF, mais toute la filière, sur le futur programme de construction du parc électronucléaire des EPR2. Thanks, Olivier. Um, coming from the energy production to its uh, transmission and then um, to its distribution, this is a highly attractive market driven by the energy transition, increased energy demand and the delay of renewal investments of the past. Energy transition, yeah. so the change from fossil energy sources to renewables, um, plus in Germany, um, the exit from nuclear energy. So investments have to be done um, in the energy transmission grid. Yeah. So we talk about new lines from onshore, offshore wind parks, PV farms or other decentralized um, production sources. Um, investments into this energy storage, including net stabilizing equipment in order to balance out um, grid and voltage fluctuations. And finally, investments into the grid intelligence to gain the ability to monitor and steer, um, steer the grid flows. Um, in the end, the grid has to become much more intelligent, whereas in the past, the flow of energy was cleared from production to consumption, we now move into a world of prosumers. Um, the energy transition also causes the rising demand, for example, because of electromobility, um, but also um, growth of the economy is increasing demand uh, for energy. Uh, SPI is best positioned um, in the market because of fee four main reasons. Um, uh, first of all, uh, we are present alongside the whole length of the grid from the production um, over the transmission to the distribution um, until the final end consumer. Uh, secondly, um, we have a lot of knowledge of the grid 
as we work in this brown field since first time installations have often been uh, done by us. Um, thirdly, we are the biggest player in Europe um, with 16% of our revenue, 1.1 billion euros and an employee capacity spread across nine countries in, in Europe. And finally, um, we offer the whole value chain of services, uh, starting from the engineering, the planification, um, the construction, installation, commissioning and operation, and finally the service and maintenance. Let's take a look at some um, examples. Um, the picture uh, shall illustrate, um, help us to illustrate two project examples. The first one is the erection of a new air insulated substation to connect a wind park to the transmission grid. Each wind park needs to have such a small um, substation to assemble the produced energy uh, from the windmills and to transform it uh, to um, and transform the energy to uh, the transmission grid level. Um, the second example is focusing on our technical control center in Berlin. After having erected a large number of these small substations for wind farms, um, um, we are monitoring a lot of them in a 24-7 real-time mode. Uh, for incident management, uh, service and maintenance, we are using our 1SP network across Germany. 47 wind parks, two PV farms and one steel plant um, are currently under our control. And next to this, um, we do offer service and maintenance for additional 70 wind parks in Germany. Um, coming back to the picture again, so the energy is um, transmitted um, to the city and uh, they are transformed to the distribution grid and then um, deploy it to um, the single consumers, yeah, a household or an industrial plant. Uh, let's assume that the city there on the slide is Hamburg and we now move in uh, to one district of Hamburg, that's the district of Eilbeck, that leads us to our distribution grid example. Um, in order to be able to manage the modernization and new installation of their energy grid, our customer Stromnetze Hamburg awarded us with a one-stop shop solution uh, with a new contract to completely modernize, newly build and digitally document the medium and high voltage grid of the district of Eilbeck over the next five years. The contract has a base volume of estimated 40 million euros, uh, basing on a pre-calculated budget um, value for Stromnetze Hamburg. This is a unique contract which shall ensure quickness of project realization after our detailed design and calculation. This contractual model is exactly um, made for us as it looks at the whole value chain of services and offers huge potential um, to expand to other cities. Various studies estimate an investment volume for the expansion and modernization of the distribution grid in German cities to 30 to, well, from 30 to 40 um, billion euros until 2030. Yeah, with these great news, I hand over uh, to leave. Yeah, thank you, Marcus. Um, and as I said in our introduction to the theme energy shift, we've been building an experience to be ready once the hydrogen market comes to full potential. And the figures on this sheet show that it indeed will be a huge market. As by 2050, 14% of the EU energy mix is predicted to consist out of hydrogen. And the 2020 EU hydrogen strategy study claims that 6.8 billion euros of annual investments will be required to be invested in production, storage and distribution and retail to achieve this goal. So the central question for us is how we will secure business in the hydrogen market. And to answer this, let's have a bit closer look at uh, this market from both an application perspective as from a technical perspective. So for one, the value chain ranges from original equipment manufacturers, gas producers, renewable energy producers to hydrogen users. And already now, we service this whole value chain with our current offer. 
and all really all players whether they be energy players oil and gas companies and utilities they are moving already now towards green hydrogen production and as industrials want and will need to address their CO2 emissions, methanation is expected to onset soon. The market for HRS solutions, which is the mobile hydrogen solution market, is still in a very early stage. And experts think that the hydrogen market will remain local, despite the huge investments needed and also despite the high technicality. So with our culture of proximity being very close to market and very close to customers, we think that SPI is ideally placed to capture this market. And looking at the technical perspective, this value chain is very complex. There's still a lot of uncertainties about the large scale business case and the multiple combination of existing and innovative technologies needed to produce and distribute hydrogen. These technology, for example, they listen to the names like thermochemical conversion, membrane bioreactors, methanation, hydrogen compression, dehydrogenation, etc. But to demystify this a bit, if you give it a closer look, in essence, these technologies again are a combination of electricity, of mechanical, of connectivity, of inspection and automation skills, and yes, at high pressure and low temperatures. But SPI, being an integrator by its nature, an integrating of technologies by its nature, we are perfectly placed to develop these into one combined hydrogen offer. And we also think, and that's also what you read in the market, is that in the end price competitiveness will be less of a differentiating factor in this market, but the ability to provide solutions and to master specific technologies. So coming back to the question, Will we be able to capture the hydrogen market? We definitely say yes. We have a couple of interesting examples to share. At the right of the picture you see the gate liquid natural gas terminal, the LNG terminal, at the port of Rotterdam in the Netherlands. And this terminal is the future portal to hydrogen, to carbon conversion and to carbon capture. And it already announced significant investment projects in the coming 10 years, like portals, like liquid bio LNG, like hydrogen truck loading facilities, etc. We've been awarded the first of this range of interesting investment project uh, called the Jetty Bypass, and it was a very complex project of extreme importance to the customers. Our scope of works included the engineering, the prefabrication, the pre shutdown coordination, and all mechanical works, including the installation. And this Jetty Bypass had after months of preparation just to be installed in a six days time frame, which shows how competent we are in our experience. And at the left, you see two hydrogen refueling stations in France, one in Cherbourg and the other one in La Havre. And there, our scope of work again included the full scope of works, the preparatory studies and permitting, the design, the detailed design, the construction, and works in electricity, instrumentation, piping and installation and commissioning. And it was, it was done together with companies like McPhy, um, which shows us that we can provide turnkey projects to our customers in the hydrogen market. And not on this seat, sheet, but still very relevant, is that we also can offer hydrogen, en hydrogen engines to replace high diesel consuming generators at construction sites. So now let's move to the second pillar and the second pillar is to reduce energy consumption by optimizing energy efficiency for buildings, for cities and for industry. And overall let's remember that uh, the EU target in energy efficiency improvement is 32% from 2007 to 2030. And obviously buildings are the biggest greenhouse emitter in Europe and in France, for example, housing and commercial buildings stand for one-fourth, 25,000 of the green gas emission. And all over Europe, regulation leads new buildings to consume less and less energy. In France, for example, the, the new regulation called the Environmental Regulation 2020 Réglementation environnementale 2020 
urges to reduce by 75% the energy consumed by the offices compared to the previous law, which was called Reglementation Thermique 2012. So, and in many cases, the aim for the building is to produce more energy that they will consume through renewable uh, energy equipments. In 2020, SPI achieved 28% of its revenue in build intake installation and FM activities that allow to reduce the carbon print of building through energy reservation, energy renovation, energy use optimization, I shall give you some examples, and energy storage in link with regulatory compliance. In this aim, SPI can propose to its client to promote renewables install electrical vehicle charger, heat pumps, automation to master energy consumption with a focus on recovery plans on public buildings. And as uh, Marcus and Liv will like, energy efficiency also concerns industry decarbonation and infrastructure. In this field, SPI is mainly active on two fronts. The first one is public lighting, where LED relamping allows magi massive energy saving but also fiber telecom networks which consume less energy than other networks. And on top of that, you have to keep in mind that Wi-Fi network, for example, consume today 2.5 less energy than it was the case uh, five years ago. And in a similar way, antenna for 5G consume 30 to 40% less energy than 4G uh, antenna for a similar volume of uh, data processed. Apart from this example of new buildings, the renovation is the key market to reach the EU objective of reduction by 30% of CO2 emission by 2030 in the tertiary sector. And in France, for example, the tertiary law, which is also called Loi Elan, is aiming at reducing energy consumption by 40% in 2030 compared to 2010 or later for existing building and it's even 50% in 2040 and 60% uh, in 2050. Globally for non-residential buildings the increase in, invest in investment should reach 60% in SPI countries from 2020 to 2030 and 10% of that is addressable by SPI. To accompany this ambition, stimulus plan in France and Germany include, for example, 7 billion for public building energy efficiency and quite the half of that, 3.2 billion, is addressable by SPI. Examples show that energy saving can reach up to 60% in a building through energy reserva uh, renovation and SPI is usually in the best situation to provide its clients with energy audits due to our technical skills that Liv mentioned a few minutes ago, but also through our long-term relationship with our clients and deep knowledge of their use of the building. The key topic we address in energy renovation are HVAC equipments, including heat pumps, lighting system, renewable energy networks from geothermy to solar panel, control and energy management systems, taking into account the real use of the building. And if we take a look at the building tech FM market, it's, uh, it's uh, boosted today by energy management system and digital workplace solution. And obviously in this context, SPI is a strong partner to commit on long-term achievements through energy performance contract. To manage these uh, energy performance contracts, SPI created a digital platform which is called Smart FM 360, which allows energy management in real time. And I would like to show you a one minute film on this innovative SPI solution.
So now let's take another example, which is a reference by SPI facility in France uh, within, as I said, an energy performance contract to support the target of Generali, Generali with a major real estate operators. So this contract is on two buildings for 44,000 square meters, and the, the contract was between 2017 and 2021. There were several objectives. The first one was to improve the comfort of the occupants, but meanwhile focusing on environmental objective. And there was a clear objective of reduction of energy consumption by 11% within the four years. And we had to define a program of new equipments while optimizing the building management system. And once more, we had to use our knowledge of the use of the building. So um, to do that, uh, SPI facilities had a deep knowledge of this site because we had a full facility management contract covering soft and hard services since uh, 2012. And so on the one hand, we proposed to our client to invest on assess improvement such as uh, LED lighting in the parking lot, coupled with a reduction of light intensity at some period of the day, three-way valves, on the air handling units and improvement of the thermal insulation of the HVAC network. On the other hand, we adapted certain technical specifications through a more accurate building management, such as the period of shutdown of the HVAC equipment according to the real use of each part of the building, the temperature of domestic hot water, or the reduction of light timers. And in fact, we generated some energy saving without any impact on employees' comfort. And at the contrary, there was some investment in terms of energy because during period of high heat, we adapted the, the blowing temperature of air, air handling units in offices to increase the comfort of the occupants. And finally, after four years, instead of reducing the energy consumption by 11%, we tripled that and reach minus 32%. On the one hand, we receive a bonus from our client and our contract was renewed by mutual agreement with no bid in one of the buildings. And one positive aspect to be noticed is the fact that both assets increase their value since owing to this energy performance contract, our client obtained the valuation exceptional on the high environmental quality certification. So it was really a positive operation for him. Now I hand over to Marcus. Yeah, thanks a lot, Olivier. So uh, to be able to realize those energy efficiency gains, yeah, you need to exactly know what's going on in a building or a larger site. Yeah? Thus to create um, a valid database for the analysis, a cost benefit evaluation of the energy efficiency measures and then finally, you need to monitor the success of the implemented measures. Um, the SPI Energy Manager is a cloud-based energy management uh, system which enables to gather and analyze all en energy relevant data and associated measured input and output values. Um, our greatest asset is the experience gained from thousands of energy efficiency projects with our clients through comprehensive, transparent energy data and benchmarks, we are able to consult our clients to reduce their CO2 footprint. Um, with the energy manager, ESG requirements of our clients can be met and green uh, building standards and decarbonization, decarbonization targets can be achieved simply, sustainably, and that's most important, verifiably. Yeah, let's take a look at a different building, yeah, a special building, the data centers. This market um, uh, of data centers is highly attractive. Yeah? On the one hand, because of the investment volumes. Um, we look at 43 billion euros of investments um, until 2026. Yeah? Five key country markets account for 70% of data center space in Europe. That is France, Germany, Netherlands, UK, and Ireland. Um, Cloud-managed services are the major driver 
um, with a growth of 11% um, per annum in Europe. There are France, Germany and the Netherlands have large cloud service markets with low adaptation currently. The adaptation is below 30% for the moment. Technically, the market entry barrier is high in all phases of the value chain. So in the engineering installation, the operation and the service and maintenance. So it is ideally a market made for us. In addition, the Climate Neutral Data Center Pact to achieve climate neutrality by 2030 is a remarkable initiative within the European Green Deal, but also fuels a lot, a lot of investment um, money to, um, to perform data centers better. Um, to give you a few um, figures, the energy consumption of um, data centers is huge. The data centers in Frankfurt, purely in Frankfurt, consume 20% of the whole energy consumption of the city of Frankfurt, even more than Frankfurt Airport, of course, before Corona times. Um, um, becoming more energy efficient is of major importance. Also, climate neutrality can only be reached with uh, green energy. Um, the KPIs um, we placed here on the slides give you a comparison of data center which was installed in 2015 and one which was installed 2021. We have been for both the general contractor for the technical installation of all the assets and the energy savings going along with these better performance figures are 1.3 million euros per annum savings. Um, translated this into CO2 savings, we talk about 3,800 tons per annum. So it is a huge technological progress, yeah, what we look at. Yeah. Um, coming to infrastructure and um, smart, um, uh, uh, smart public lighting. Yeah. Um, street lighting is an essential task of municipal public welfare. Uh, brightly, lit streets, um, lit, uh, brightly lit streets bring safety and well-being of cities, um, but also allow for huge energy savings. Public lighting systems consume um, up to 40% of the city's electricity costs, um, and LED technolo technology allows up to 70% of energy savings by smart public lighting system, which also allow to use sensoric for dimming and the luminaries um, yeah, can also be solar powered if needed. In addition to that, LEDs, um, LED lights are also a carrier for multiple sensoric aspects and can thus play a vital role in the smart city of tomorrow. Um, the market is attractive as 90% of Europe's lighting infrastructure has yet to be converted to LED. Uh, SPI is an innovative market leader in the Netherlands and one of the top three um, service providers of st for street lighting services in Germany. Let's take a look at a small example. That is the contract with the municipality in Bekdalen. Hopefully I, I pronounce it right. Um, the example shows you a contract with a municipality in the province of Limburg consisting of um, the three um, communities, Schinnen, Nud, and Onderbanken. So uh, we already changed the lamps in 2017 for the community Schinnen, um, and we um, gained recently in 2020 the contract to replace all the, light, all the existing lamps of the two other communities to LED, uh, means 3,400 um, lamps. The fixtures all were also equipped with a so-called Zaga connector um, so that the lamps are prepared for future IoT solutions and sensors. In total, providing for savings until 2030 of 800,000 euros for um, the municipality, um, and translated into CO2 savings of 190 tons. It's not a data center, of course, yeah, but um, definitely savings which are good for the municipality and the communities. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, so now let's have a final look at uh, industry. 
and industry puts us for an interesting uh, dilemma. Uh, on the one hand, they provide us with the products we need for daily use, but they also provide us with the products we need for the huge transition into a green economy. No heat pump without steel industry, no lead lamp without chemical industry. So we cannot live without the industry, not now and not also in the future. But however, this industry, the same industry today, supplies about a quarter of the CO2 emissions from all industrial sector. So hence decarbonation is key. And to achieve this, or to achieve the EU decarbonation targets, industry should achieve 33% reduction in CO2 emissions by 2050. And to realize this, 18.5 billion euros of investments will be required. And that can only be realized by energy efficiency, by circularity, by electrification of the heat production and the usage of low carbon energy sources. So what we can offer to the industry is a full scope of technical and analytical services and competences. So we, re we really can help the industry to realize their ambitions with respect to decarbonation. We can offer them energy scans, we can offer them smart energy management systems, but we can also offer them the full scope of building, of maintenance, of anything you th could think of for decarbonation, like power to heat systems, plastic to oil, plastic to chemical, regeneration, capturing and transforming residual heat, heat pumps, recycling waste streams, magnetic couplings, etc., etc. We have plenty and plenty of examples how we can service this industry in reaching their targets. And a very interesting example is the Gopener Beer Brewery in the Netherlands. They turn to us with their ambition to become fully carbon neutral by 2030. It was an open discussion. Let's sit together and help us realize this ambitious target. And we worked with them to find the best solutions. For example, we proposed an innovative technique called the EcoStripper, which is a new way for the cooking process. We changed the steam generation to a heat pump, which allows the replacement of gas to electricity. And at the same time, we had to adapt the whole electrical infrastru infrastructure to these technical interventions. But we also provided them with energy scans, with inspection and the full certification. And this resulted in 75% reduction in their heat consumption, but it also realized for them a two-third reduction in their process energy peak. But also nice to mention it is that this new technique allowed Gulpener to use 100% local wheats of their own region instead of having to import them from all over the world. And in the past, they, were only used, they could only use 5 to 10%. Now they can use 100% local wheats. So it's decarbonation, it's a joint effort, but it's also local economy at the same time. Yeah, looking um, at mobility, um, we shortly see an introductory um, jingle. So mobility is the third pillar. Um, here under we subsume all solutions to enable the shift to a sustainable mobility. Currently with only 6% of our total revenue it's the smallest pillar, but of course with the highest growth rates um, in the future. 
Um, SPI is also here well positioned across the whole value chain of services. Um, and um, if we um, look at those different items, we want to talk about um, electromobility, um, urban mobility solutions and teleworking solutions. And I would like to start um, to take you with me um, for e-mobility. Um, after a slow start, um, the market shall develop by a projection of electrical vehicles um, increasing by 34% per annum uh, to reach 28 million electrical vehicles by 2030. And uh, to resolve this chicken and egg problem, the recent governmental stimulus packages um, shall boost particularly the public charging infrastructure. And I want to give you um, a very recent example in Germany where we work on a large tender process which is currently in preparation and called Deutschlandnetz. So the government decided um, to spend 2 billion euros um, to create a very dense network of high power charging sites to create over 1,000 of those sites including over 10,000 of those high power charging points. Um, so obviously um, it's a governmental, so regulated um, tender process. You cannot bid for the whole two billion, yeah, but definitely it's very attractive um, uh, for us um, because of the complexity of the offer. Um, this is generally where we are present, yeah, where the solution gets more complex, yeah, either in terms of size of the offer and man, um, charging points to be managed, or in terms of technical complexity, um, this is what we see in high power charging systems. Yeah. And of course, we are present, uh, for example, in France, um, still on the other page, in France, where we even offer a complete end-to-end -end solution called Oreos. That's what you see on the very bottom right side of the page. Yeah. Um, now we can move over to the next page. Yeah. Um, we have installed in Germany um, around 7,000 charging points. Yeah. So um, I don't want to talk about installation. I would like to talk about a contract which we recently won for service and maintenance repair um, in combination with the hotline service we offer uh, to ensure high availability and rapid resolution. Um, for the customer EWE Go. Yeah, and EWE Go is the largest electromobility provider in the northwestern part of Germany and a subsidiary of the distribution system operator EWE. Um, they already created a dense charging network where also SPI was working um, for and installing um, charging points. Yeah. Um, and currently they look at um, a, a little bit above uh, 900 AC and DC charging points. Um, uh, interestingly, all charging points um, are powered by 100% green electricity. I think that's important. And for us, next to this maintenance uh, contract, uh, we look at further business opportunities because EWE wants to double its size of the charging infrastructure firstly uh, with business opportunities and installation, but then afterwards in service and maintenance and repair. Yeah, um, I'm very happy um, um, that um, SPDZE um, joined the, Euroof, uh, the OIREF um, community in, in August uh, 2021 this year, so very, very recent. And we look forward to move to the Euref campus Düsseldorf in 2024, because it needs to be built. Um, uh, the Euref community itself consists of companies exploring on mobility solutions of the future, energy transition, as well as climate protection solutions. Large companies like SPI or Schneider Electric will be present, yeah, but also startups um, sell, shall settle down in this um, campus and are part of this community. The Euref campus will be the largest CO2 neutral campus in North Rhine-Westphalia and will also serve as the largest mobility hub in North Rhine-Westphalia. It shall be a research campus and lab for intelligent mobility concepts, a showcase for electromobility, 
uh, for example, inductive charging, bidirectional charging. Um, it shall be a hydrogen hub, and e-fuels um, shall be um, researched. Yeah. Uh, we will be uh, not only a tenant, yeah, we will hold the contract yeah, to operate the whole campus over a period of 15 years. For our employees, this is a great place to work as of 2024, and for our clients and business partners, it's a strong signal that SP is part of the green solution. And by the way, the Euref campus fulfills the CO2 targets of the German government for 2045 um, as from day one in 2024. Now, that is a great signal to all our stakeholders. Thank you, Marcus. I always want to have an office in Düsseldorf then instead of in the yes. Netherlands. You can rent it. So, <laughs> one of the main concerns for governments is how to keep a congested city livable with respect to clean water and to clean air, food distribution, safety and security. And road traffic optimization addresses these topics and at the same time they also address delivering quick environmental wins. If you know that 74% of the transport CO2 emissions are produced by road traffic, and then it's interesting to know that a predictive traffic management system can improve road congestion with 20%. Then it's only a small step to invest in traffic data systems, in prioritized traffic lighting, and in smart parking systems. And over the past year, SPI's more and more proven that we take up a, 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 valuable pla a valuable place in the world where we work and live and that we have become an expert in smart traffic optimization technologies. So we've been awarded contracts in installation of selective vehicle detection systems, in sensoring and software for digital signage of car parks, in camera systems, and we've also been supplying technical and IT equipment for traffic control centers, but we also can operate them on a 24-7 service. And an interesting example is something which has been developed by SPI Belgium, and which is a 100% SPI product, it's the AC system. This is basically a priority system for vehicles with a centimeter accurate localization. And it provides buses and trams to control traffic lights and access barriers by a data exchange system between the driver's interface and the roadside loop. And this 100% speed product has already been installed in more than 6,500 vehicles and over 8,000 ground installations in Europe. Recently, we've been awarded an interesting contract at the loop in the exhibition city of Ghent in Belgium and this system regulates the often very dense traffic flow in this exhibition center, but at the same time, it also helps keeping our traffic out of the city of Ghent. Thank you, Liv. So now let's focus on teleworking. Maybe many of you tested that between the, during the COVID-19 pandemic, and in the coming years, teleworking will become a new way of working for many people since 40% of European people are expected to telework in 2025 compared to 10% in 2019. And obviously this evolution will include increased flex office organization. This new behavior will have a positive impact. It's obvious on green gas emissions since, for example, it was calculated that in France reducing increasing by 18% teleworking in France compared to pre-COVID uh, period could uh, reduce CO2 emission by 3,300 tons per day. To allow this migration, our ICS division in all our countries support our client transformation on a large and decentralized scale with the implementation of collaborative solution such as video conference or collaborative workspace. During the pandemic period, we must have in mind that the number of uh, cyber attacks on small and mid-sized companies increased by 20 to 25 percent. And more than ever in this situation, we must ensure a strong IT network reliability. The right network operating center, the customized traditional and cloud solution 
keeping in mind that uh, in the coming years, investment in cloud infrastructure should increase by 11% per year, and obviously structured cybersecurity strategies and technologies. In this context of increasing number of cyber attacks, that is key to manage the risk generated by the remote work from home. And we know that from 2019 to 2025, the cybersecurity cyber security market is expected to grow by 14% per year in the UE. Last but not least, and it's very important in our CSR approach, our program and solution to our clients are also based on responsible digital solution. And for example, our French ICS division is about to receive next month, sorry, uh, we are a little late, it will be in October, the label responsible digital services company, which includes several topics. The first one is IT for green actions, and we present you today many solutions using data management to increase energy efficiency. Green for IT, for example, like the hyperconvergence technology in order to reduce the space used by data. And also digital sobriety, including reduction of data stored, sent or printed by each employee or the extension of the lifetime of devices or servers. Now, if we move to an example, we can highlight our partnership with the French National Family Allowance Fund, which is called Caisse Nationale d'Allocation Familiale. And in fact, this client uh, wished to entrust the operation and maintenance of his central unified communication infrastructure, as well as the evolution of its IT infrastructure to a service provider like SPI, capable of supporting it through the geographic footprint of this uh, Caisse Nationale, which has 120 sites in France and overseas. And the final objective for the 36,000 employees was on the one hand to benefit from an improved digital workplace with the installation of 450 video conference room with Cisco and related technologies. And on the other hand, make the remote home working organization a reality in a really short time in order to ensure an optimal civil service continuity to beneficiaries despite the COVID-19 lockdown. What is less visible for employee but key to, to deliver such a, a contract is a strengthened backbone infrastructure through ICS operational condition, maintenance and managed services of the IT infrastructure, which include two data centers. For the remote home working, the solution provided by SP also covers the implementation and application flows of the collaborative work solution on each laptop and PC, connection and cyber security protocols implementation, and the administration, the global administration of the security roles on the client infrastructure, including firewalls, network, or VPN. And obviously, we also provided to the 36,000 employees the needed support to adapt themselves and even some supplies like user headsets for home offices. In a nutshell, to make this partnership success successful, as it is the case today, the client is really satisfied with SPI. Um, our understanding of the client organization of, and expectation was key, but also our ability to propose in the same contract, on the one hand, project management, but also manage services at a large scale. Now, I hand over to Jérôme. Thank you, Olivier, Liver, and Marcus. Very clear um, demonstration that definitely speed and enabler to this uh, energy transition. And obviously, with those expected massive investments, both OPEX and CAPEX, to come, uh, needless to say that we are uh, benefiting from very favorable rings on all our uh, markets. And this obviously would create unprecedented uh, market dynamism on, uh, on addressable market to, to, to speed. So I am not able, I'm not allowed to provide you with any kind of uh, midterm guidance or whatsoever that we uh, normally don't do, but I'm more than happy to 
give you some very concrete example on how our um, future organic growth could be, could be enhanced. First, starting with some quite uh, large uh, addressed market, uh, which represent quite significant revenue contributions uh, at speed. Starting with the transmission and distribution networks. As you know, we are number one in, uh, in Germany on that market, number one in, uh, in the Netherlands as well. Those markets are already benefiting from very large and significant investment from large uh, transmission and distribution system uh, operators. This obviously in connection with the necessary connection of new renewable energy uh, power generation system to, to the grid. Also regarding building uh, renovation, as very well evidenced and demonstrated by, by my colleagues, they will necessarily have to consider new energy efficiency uh, rules and, and, and update, upgrade, modification, renovation of those buildings will constitute uh, even more further a significant uh, attractive market. Public lighting with the change in technology, using more and more LED type of technology for uh, allowing for low consumption uh, systems. And finally, industry decarbonation or electrification of, of the industry will also be a, a quite significant, significant level. Altogether, those markets, we see them evolving from 4 to 5% uh, organically in the, in, in the coming years. This is for what I would consider as a lion's share of our current activities and the way our, our activities would evolve. But next to that, uh, we also will benefit from uh, significant boosters. These markets are pretty new, quite not really significant in our total turnover at the time we speak, but we anticipate very fast growing conditions uh, in, the, in the years to come. Electromobility, uh, you have uh, heard Marcus and, uh, and uh, Liv and Olivier talking about uh, uh, charging points that we are already installing uh, across the various, uh, various countries. Our turnover on that activity has already doubled in the, in the very recent years and there are obviously much more to come. We are expecting two-digit growth in the, in, in the coming years. Then we have, uh, obviously, all the new installations, all the new uh, farms related to renewable energy, solar panels, uh, wind, uh, uh, windmills, and obviously biomass uh, combined heat and, heat and power generation. These are also new niche markets where SPI can definitely uh, play a key role and demonstrate that it is uh, an enabler towards the energy transition. Finally, regarding hydrogen, uh, we anticipate, uh, again, hydrogen uh, in the total energy uh, consumptions by 2050 to reach up to 15%, which is obviously uh, the demonstration of necessary prior massive investments uh, that we will be able also to, to play with. So, in aggregate, cannot uh, display any, any fixed figures, but understand that uh, seen from our viewpoint, we, we would definitely consider these are unprecedented uh, uh, market dynamisms. In terms of our green share, this will translate into an obvious uh, favorable change in our mix and based on the detailed uh, business plan assumptions we, we have worked out with, uh, with a bottom-up approach, we consider that by 2025, our green share that you know is today 41% should be lifted up to circa 50%, which obviously goes in the very well, uh, very good direction, assuming uh, that the European taxonomy uh, remain, uh, remains unchanged, uh, of course. Finally, uh, massive stimulus plans. It has been uh, already addressed uh, earlier, post-COVID. We know that and we anticipate that the, the lion's share of these plans would be dedicated to the energy transition, would be dedicated to the digitalization of our, of our territories. We heard about the European Union's communicating on those plans. We also heard from, the, uh, from the certain governments, of which the German and the French states, who have uh, quite uh, communicated on it in a detailed way, and, and definitely 
uh, our addressable markets will be enhanced, will be uh, amplified uh, with such. We talk about hydrogen, of course, electrification in the industry or decarbonation, uh, energy renovation for building, both private and public buildings, and of course, for regarding digitization, uh, the uh, deployment of fiber networks across territories as well as 5Gs. These markets are not uh, available just for once. Obviously, it will deploy and it's smoothly starting from 2021, 2022, and for the coming years. It will also uh, compensate and help to compensate certain sectors, certain ver verticals, where obviously we, we, we have seen post-COVID uh, post some, uh, some uh, potential negative impact. This is it for me. Thank you very much. And I now hand over to Isabelle Lambert. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to uh, be there to explain you the differences between the two frameworks that we have been using to measure our contribution. As Jérôme just said, 70% of our activities are called energy transition solutions and they were measured against a, refer a reference framework called the net uh, environmental contribution and the 41 percent which you are seeing are the revenue which are aligned not eligible but aligned with the EU taxonomy criteria for sustainable activities so on the taxonomy as you know this is a classification systems that covers all industrial sectors almost all and that defines with specific technical performance criteria what is green from what isn't. And at the moment, the EU Commission has only been publishing the regulation and taxonomy criteria that are valid for two of their, out of their six environmental objectives. These are climate change mitigation and climate change adaptation. So this is this is public information, public criteria, and those, that, those criteria that we have been using since uh, 2019 when we first published our green share. So the four other uh, objectives and the associated criteria are yet to be published early 2022. How does it work at SPI? We have been screening for two years all of our revenues at operational level against uh, technical performance criteria, which are called substantial contribution. And on top of that, we also make sure that those revenue do no significant harm to other environmental objectives. So for instance, biodiversity or uh, water resources. And last, we must also ensure that all our activities are conducted with the appropriate social safeguards, so respecting fundamental labor laws. So all, I must say, all of our activities which pass the technical performance criteria, this step one, substantially contribute, they also pass the other criteria at SPI. So they do no significant harm to other environmental objectives and they are done with the appropriate social safeguards. Uh, those works, those measurements have been audited in the past two years by our statutory auditors, PwC, because we publish such data in our annual report in the extra financial performance declaration. The second reference framework, which ha we have been using, uh, let me first explain why. Uh, the EU taxonomy uh, is binary by design. So either you pass the technical performance criteria and, and the two other tests, and then you qualify 100% of your revenue, 100% is green, but if you don't pass it by a few percent, and I will give you examples of technical performance criteria later, then you cannot qualify um, any 
any euro of your revenue, of your corresponding revenue. So it's black or white. And the NEC, so the net environmental contribution metric, which has been, which is an open source framework supported by, by investors uh, such as Sycomore at the beginning, and I mean designed, uh, worked out by expert consultants, allows to have a more incremental view uh, at your revenue. Uh, so they say it allows you to see the 50 shades of green. And we've been measuring all the activities which, which do have a positive uh, contribution. So those from 0% to 100%. So we've been screening also all of our revenues against this framework. I was telling you that the taxonomy is binary by design. Uh, and here are some of the technical performance criteria that help us most score green share points at SPI. It's in the buildings area uh, with technical, uh, technical measures that we are bringing to either new or renovated buildings. In terms of HVAC and LED systems, um, we have to install or operate um, LED or uh, ventilation systems that are at least that are state-of-the-art technologies and that score at least in the two highest energy classes for this type of equipment. Uh, of course, installing renewable energy systems uh, in buildings, installing heat pumps as well, uh, is taxonomy aligned. Um, installing or maintaining uh, electric vehicle charging stations is also viewed as green by the EU taxonomy. And uh, all the smart energy management systems that we implement at our client site, so you've, you've seen the video of smart, of smart FM 360, this is typically a service that is also uh, deemed as green by the EU taxonomy. These are also activities uh, which, uh, for which we are scoring uh, green share points and uh, EU taxonomy aligned revenues. On low carbon transport infrastructure, installing um, electricity for... Um, um, <laughs> so, <laughs> for those... Waterways. For waterways, thank you Gauthier. <laughs> Uh, helps, of course, to decarbonize uh, that kind of transportation. But the lion's share on this slide is being done at speed with electricity trans uh, transmission and distribution, as well as uh, our contribution to renewables and data centers. On data centers, let me explain the technical performance criteria there. We have to prove that all our services, uh, all our distinct contributions map um, are aligned with the EU code of conduct uh, for energy efficiency in data centers. And this has also to be audited every three years by a third party. So we are one of the first companies um, that has published its uh, green share revenues or its taxonomy aligned revenue. Uh, there are, to my knowledge, there are only two, uh, two others that have published such figures. But um, the, the company ISS has published last year as part of its European Sustainable Finance Survey uh, an estimation of the taxonomy aligned revenues of the Eurostox, the DAX and the CAC uh, 40. So you can see that uh, with 41%, we're definitely um, ahead of the stock market game. And so um, explaining how, um, how we move from 41% taxonomy aligned to 70% uh, energy transition solutions according to the NEC framework, you can see that the taxonomy uh, first hasn't uh, covered necessarily all activities yet. 
um, the technical expert groups having worked on that gladly acknowledge that the taxonomy will be um, will be complemented in the years to come but for the moment for instance uh, there haven't been um, you see public lighting on on the on the scale they haven't been describing led public lighting as an activity that would be eligible uh, to the taxonomy yet we know that whenever um, sodium lights are being replaced by led lights this uh, generates 60 to 70 energy savings and this is a given everywhere um, same thing in industry, uh, we can qualify at SPI all the energy efficiency services that we provide to the buildings, uh, but uh, energy efficiency services to the industry are not described by the taxonomy, at least not yet. So uh, we, it's not in our 41%, uh, not anywhere. However, this is deemed as, uh, as part of the solution by the, the NEC framework. And, and buildings, in buildings we might in some cases, uh, for instance, in uh, building renovation, when we work in a building that faces a deep renovation, the, the building must demonstrate that uh, after the renovation, it will demand at least 30% less primary energy than before. So in, in some cases, for heritage buildings, for instance, we do not achieve such figures uh, of minus 30% energy renovation. And even if the status is much better afterwards, it is not up to the taxonomy standard. And where are the 30% um, revenue from 70% energy solutions to 100%? So you can see there are in buildings, industry, telecom, oil and gas services, and in some other uh, smaller segments of revenue. And now I think we are ready to take your questions and to answer them. So, <clears throat> so if you're in the room uh, and you want to ask a question, please raise your hand. And of course, we're going to take questions from the web platform as well. Nicola? Thank you very much. Um, the first question would be, so you said the, the, um, the stimulus in Germany and France could generate 0.5 to 1.5% additional organic growth per annum. And what's the time range? When can we expect this to materialize? And be seen in your figures. Um, the second question would be on the 29% remaining between the 41 and the 70%, which exactly are the main bricks that make the difference? And for instance, can there be some that are breached by the taxonomy, such as nuclear maintenance, for instance? I think it's not yet included. May that happen? Um, and then um, the fourth question would be on the renewable and solar plants. Uh, what is the risk? What are your assumptions in terms of pricing versus volume? Because we've seen that there may be some government cuts to the guaranteed prices that those operators get from the governments. And if there are price cuts, how much could that be impacting your maintenance contracts and, and be a drag, let's say, in the future? Thank you very much. Well, maybe to, to your last question first. Um, as it appears, uh, the, the prices uh, uh, or the subsidies from, from the government have been reducing already and, and fairly drastically in the, in the recent uh, years or in the recent months, and it doesn't affect uh, the um, uh, growth of, this, of these areas because uh, in terms of the, the, the cost uh, are also uh, have been improved also f fairly significantly, and so all, all what we see now with uh, with wind or, or solar developments are barely affected by by government uh, subsidies, which is really good news going forward. So this is a general statement. You might find the odd exception, but that is generally uh, the trend. Yeah, and uh, maybe I'll turn to to Isabel to to. Um, 
to answer the, the, the finesse of, uh, of the taxonomy. Yeah. So, as you know, the, the nuclear sector is heavily debated uh, at EU level and um, whether nuclear is being included in, in the next future, that should be solved at year's end uh, together with the gas debate. Um, you've, um, you've seen maybe in my chart that we were having gas networks uh, as, um, as energy transition solutions. It's because those networks enable also the biogas to be transported to the consumer. And the taxonomy already uh, allows gas networks as, as long as, uh, let's say, low CO2 gas is injected uh, in there to be, to be considered taxonomy aligned. For, um, yeah, what could bring us uh, in terms of climate change mitigation uh, additional uh, green revenues uh, aligned with the taxonomy. I believe that um, this energy efficiency in industry uh, will probably be tackled in a, in a second phase. Now the Commission is first of all uh, busy and the technical expert groups are very busy defining the technical performance criteria for the four other environmental objectives. But when they have published that, uh, they will then again, um, I mean, have a fresh look on the climate change mitigation and adaptation criteria, and it's their ambition to describe much more activities uh, to come cl closer to the, the whole array of uh, economic activities in the EU. And for instance, um, I think they will have noticed that some public markets, typical public markets like public lighting, where uh, tremendous efforts, as you have seen, uh, needs to be done. Um, they should be included in the taxonomy in the future. Yeah, and uh, with, with regard to the, um, to the growth, uh, I think that uh, a number of these plans are taking shape now, and I think Marcus was referring to the, to the growth in uh, e-mobility in Germany, which is fairly recent and, and really uh, stemming for, from the uh, decision of, of the government. And we, we do see a, a vast uh, uh, change taking place right now. I think it's a chicken and egg. I think the other part is that uh, the electrical vehicles in, in Germany are taking off as soon as the German vehicles electric are taking off. So it's a, a chicken and egg. Uh, 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 function. Uh, what, what we see in France is, is a, quite, quite uh, some um, more active tendering activity regarding public buildings and which uh, so far have not been part of the renovation uh, effort towards uh, um, energy efficiency. So broadly we, we think that uh, we will we'll see um, a change in 2022 and, and beyond. Um, we have a question from the web, which is how will you achieve the 50% um, green share you're targeting by 2025? What are the drivers behind um, that number? And will it be, uh, or is it based on the current taxonomy framework? Yeah, I'm happy to take that one. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, very clearly, that estimation is based on a, on a, on a bottom-up construction of our strategic plan. So it is obviously supported by some sub-markets that we have evidence as being key contributors to our future growth, key accelerating factors to our future growth. Uh, I could I could uh, name some of them, like the uh, the TND market, which will again uh, give uh, an additional contribution. The electrical vehicle and charging points infrastructure market, obviously, will be will be uh, will be part of that one. Very clearly, this extrapolation from 41% up to 50% is based on what we know today, i.e., the current uh, European taxonomy. If there are any further change, this may affect in one way or another, but that is still unknown. Um, another question from the web. Uh, are you still working on the consolidation of the CO2 emissions that are avoided thanks to your services? And if yes, when will the results uh, be available and public? 
Yeah, it's, it's more of a mid-term plan to consolidate the CO2 emissions at client, uh, at client sites. Um, the, easiest, um, the easiest thing to do is to consolidate it for energy performance contracting. For the rest, uh, there is not yet a clear reference framework which would allow uh, a company like Speed to take, uh, in a complex pro project, to take its share of its contribution from the CO2 emissions that have been saved for the client. Um, do you think that the business mix in the remaining 30% of your sales could evolve towards net compliant activities in the future? I guess it means could, they, could some of the 30%, which is uh, not green at the moment, become um, net positive in the future? I would say that at least making a projection uh, regarding our 41% becoming 50% and assuming this is part of the overall 70%, I would say by definition, yes, our 70% should rise, uh, should rise uh, as well. Could you give us more details on hydrogen? Um, uh, and in particular, sorry, why you consider that hydrogen is a big catalyst in the long term for your business? Well, I, I think uh, Liv has, um, has explained um, well wh where we could be positioned on, on that market. And, and clearly, part of it has to do with mobility, which we know is, is, a, is a market which, which will start, but, but, uh, but uh, probably uh, at, uh, starting from, from a, a small base. And uh, what we see is, uh, is more hydrogen to the industry, uh, so call it could it green, could it gray, could it blue, depending. But all together, it should be, and I don't know whether exact, where exactly it will fit in, in, the, in the taxonomy, but in terms of business going forward, that will cl clearly be um, uh, quite, quite a lot of investment, heavy industrial investment, where, uh, as we have shown today, we will have a good position. The last one for this session. Uh, with such dynamic end markets in the coming years, do you expect to see new competitors on your market? But, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, an area where, where there are a number of barriers to, to entry, and one of them being uh, attracting and uh, retaining talents in, in very specialized uh, areas. So you, I think um, uh, uh, there are a number of uh, large competitors in Europe who, who possess uh, this base is becoming uh, more and more um, uh, intricate in terms of uh, technologies to, to gather together. We, we have seen all the, the impact of the, of the digital uh, uh, content as well of all these new uh, offerings. So I, I tend to think that this is a, quite a good protection to, to entry. The other one, and maybe some, some of you might think of you know, startup uh, popping up in this sort of business, uh, as, you, as you have seen from all these examples, the, the knowledge of, um, of the customer's asset is key. And uh, these assets, again, are, are really complicated. Our customers rely heavily on us to understand and monitor these assets. And that's what we, we think. It's, uh, it's quite a, a good protection. It's uh, the, the know-how of the customer's asset is, is a key element. We have a number of examples in the past of newcomers we didn't uh, make, made it, we didn't make it because of a lack of understanding of customers' processes. Um, we'll stop here for the first Q&A session and we'll have another one uh, at the end of the event. So now we're going to take a 10 minutes break and we'll be back at uh, 3.55 sharp, please. Welcome back. So I'm pleased to say a few words about our first uh, corporate social responsibility roadmap.
Before I expose this roadmap to you, I'd like to highlight uh, for how long we have been signifying our values and our commitments uh, to, the, to the corporate and to the community at large. SPI has been a signatory of the United Nations Global Compact since 2003, meaning that we adhere and we report uh, every year to the United Nations on our commitments to the fight against corruption, to uh, labor rights, to human rights, and to environmental protection. Since 2010, uh, SPI has been um, an adamant supporter of the SHIFT project, which is a French think tank advocating the shift to a post-carbon economy. And more recently, in 2020, uh, at the very beginning of the COVID crisis, you might remember that some business groups uh, had been advocating for European regulation to be delayed in time because of the economic shock. Uh, SPI, on the contrary, has um, signaled, um, has joined the EU uh, Alliance for a Green Recovery, signaling by this way its wish for the recovery plans to fully take into account uh, the need for an environmental transition. And more recently, uh, in May this year, we've been uh, committing to set carbon footprint reduction targets, which are uh, in alignment with latest climate science by uh, joining the science-based targets. And or, um, or a carbon footprint reduction targets, you, which you will be seeing in a minute, they are currently being validated uh, by the Science-Based Targets Initiative. To design our corporate social responsibility roadmap, we've been, um, we've been first doing so-called, pardon me the jargon, materiality analysis, so we've been questioning our major stakeholders, uh, employees, clients, investors, suppliers, and partners uh, on our main stakes uh, in a three-year horizon. Stakes being economic stakes, uh, social or environmental stakes. And these are the results. So you see here pictures, pictured, sorry, the five main issues that most matter internally to us, to SPI, our uh, entire executive committee has, uh, has ranked the stakes as well, and that most matter also to all other stakeholders. The first one is the shift in energy mix, closely followed by the green economic recovery and the client shift to sustainability. And on the social side, you see that the priority is uh, health and safety, and shortages in skills. So we've been working on those results to build our roadmap, uh, which focuses on two pillars, the environmental and the social pillar, to answer our client shift to sustainability, um, to, to work with green economic recovery plans, and to accompany the um, energy transition, our green share of revenue with this objective that has been shown to you to have 50% of revenue being taxonomy aligned on climate change mitigation. That's our main contribution. And this is followed by our commitment to reduce our carbon footprint in alignment with a 1.5 degree scenario, meaning in five years from now, reducing our direct operational footprint by 25%, and on our scope three emission, making sure that 67% of our suppliers uh, taken by emissions will have themselves set carbon footprint reduction targets in five years from now. On the social side, uh, health and safety, uh, Mr. Louet had already uh, presented that our aspiration is of course to go to zero, uh, zero severe accidents in the future, the midterm goal is to have the number of severe accidents. And on diversity, 
our objective on key management positions, so this is approximately the top 250 in the company, is to increase uh, the number of women within those positions by 25%. And now I will be showing you a small video of our carbon footprint commitment. At SPEE, as a company, we know that we have a duty to fight climate change. That is why we are committed to reducing our carbon footprint by 25% by 2025. Specifically, our vehicle fleet represents 87% of our direct carbon footprint. Therefore, we are reducing our fuel consumption and our greenhouse gas emissions by integrating more electric and hybrid vehicles in our fleet. By 2025, more than one third of our vehicles will be electric. Reducing vehicle and engine size. Installing charging infrastructure on our sites. Optimizing our trips encouraging eco-driving and teleworking. We are also dedicated to reducing our building emissions by improving their energy efficiency, increasing use of renewable energy. Finally, we are tackling all our indirect emissions as well by asking our suppliers to set ambitious carbon emission reduction targets, reducing business travel and encouraging environmentally friendlier options improving our waste sorting and recycling. We have joined other companies in setting science-based targets. And we are committed to limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius for the future generation. So have you, as you've seen from this short video, our direct operational footprint is highly dominated by our fleet. So there, the main objective is to substitute uh, fossil fueled vehicles by electrified ones. To, today, I mean today, no, uh, back in 2019, we've taken a 2019 baseline to set carbon footprint reduction targets because it was kind of a normal year. Uh, in 2020, we, we have been achieving a carbon footprint reduction, but which was uh, largely contextual COVID-wise. So 2019 is our baseline uh, for most of these CSR roadmap objectives. So back in 2019, we had 2% of vehicles which were um, so-called low carbon. And this year, um, the last six months, our, our car policy have been um, massively changed across all subsidiaries. You see here an example of SPI UK, which has already changed a third of its van fleet and uh, switched this fleet to electric vans. And all in all, our uh, I mean, low carbon fleet has already moved from 2% in 2019 uh, to 3% end of 2020, but in the first semester, we already moved to 7% of the fleet being low carbon. So hybrid and hybrid electric and fully electric vehicles. Our indirect uh, footprint is the most difficult for us to tackle. Because we have in excess of 70,000 suppliers, we are uh, close to the client, but that means also that our uh, procurement is made locally, most of our procurement. And this is our challenge to embark 67% of the suppliers uh, that make the emissions of our procured goods and services towards setting ambitious carbon footprint reduction targets. To do so, we can rely on a long-standing um, sustainable procurement policy. So SPI has been already discussing CSR and assessing its supplier on CSR for more than 10 years. So this is the kind of dialogue that our procurement teams were already used to having. But now it's about to get specific and demanding on CO2 reduction. On safety, you can see, um, you, you can see the baseline and the historical progression 
of our severe accidents on the left. Severe accidents, we were having 20 of them back in 2018, reducing them to 16 the year after and to 12 last year. The um, prevention policies at SPI have been focusing uh, lately on severe accidents and we've been launching a campaign which is called the Life Saving Rules this year, uh, which will have further ramification um, in, the, in the years to come, which is really focusing on those main risks, so um, elect electrical risk, uh, lift, um, lifting risk, working at height and driving, those are our main risks. Uh, focusing on them so as to make sure that nobody gets severely hurt when working at SPI. On gender diversity, uh, SPI was also having for many years um, a network called So SPI Ladies, which is um, sensitizing internally for gender diversity, um, for instance, developing awareness raising sessions on, on bias. But by setting a formal objective, uh, we hope to make further progress in attract, attracting women in the company and retaining them as well. We need to work on, on, both, um, on both levers to achieve this ambitious objective, because today, when you advertise a management position, you barely receive female CVs in our sectors. And last, I wanted to give you an overview of how um, extra financial rating agencies view SP. We've been starting to engage and to have, um, to have a dialogue with those three agencies last year only. And hence, we've made significant progress in our ratings, especially with uh, Sustainalytics, which uh, now views us as a low-risk company in terms of ESG, with MSCI, uh, where we are rated A, and with Vigeo, which considers that we are uh, the second uh, most sustainable company in the industrial goods and services in Europe. And now it's my pleasure to hand over to Regina Stachelhaus, the chairwoman of the CSR and Governance Committee of the board. Thank you very much, Isabel. I would like, um, yeah, bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. I would like uh, to take the opportunity today to present to you the role of the supervisory board for CSR at SPI. Um, but first, let me briefly introduce myself and explain my role at the board. I joined the board of SPI in 2014, right before the IPO, and today I'm heading the committee of CSR and governments, as it was already mentioned before. So, by profession, I'm an educated lawyer familiar with compliance, and I spent more than 20 years with HP, I think well known in this audience here, the world lead, one of the world leading IT and digital solution companies in these older days. I headed the legal department and I held several management positions in admin sales and marketing, and finally, as a vice president and member of the German board responsible for the printer business. And thereafter, I joined the board of E.ON SE, I think well known too, I'm an uh, Eurostox company, international energy producer and provider. And I was in the board um, in charge group wide for all service functions, including the HR director, IT procurement and again legal. And in between these two jobs, I spent, I would say, uh, two very valuable years with UNICEF or UNICEF an NGO founded, founded by the United Nations, taking care for the wealth of children. And I was heading the German section to help them out of a crisis at that point in time. So sometimes I call it a kind of a work-life donation. Since um, I focus on non-operational duties, I took on a number of supervisory board mandates, 
in various industries and countries like Germany, France and the UK. So today's presenters have shown you, you in detail um, our sustainability strategy and my goal in this presentation is now to show you how well sustainability is embedded in SPIES governance and how SPIES governance ensures the consistent and efficient implementation of SPIES sustainability strategy. So um, sustainability is indeed embedded in the group's governance and today I'm going to focus on the three following topics. Number one, the clear CSR accountability that is present through the entire organization. Number two, the inclusion of the CSR criteria in the senior management's compensation. And third, the strong policies the group has with regards to ethics and compliance. So here you see a SPIS board of directors. It, uh, the board is composed of 10 members at the moment, including four women. And we are looking to recruit a fifth one um, following the resignation of Elisabeth van Damme, who represented CDPQ. Very clear, the employees are the group's number one asset, and they are at the center of its development. And this is also reflected in our board with three directors representing the employees, and one of them, Gabriel van Kleveren, um, is specifically representing the employee shareholders. We all come from various nationalities, and I think we can say that we are collectively a good reflection of the group's geographical diversity. Five directors are from France, three are German, one is Dutch and one is British. And we are a majority of independent directors, as six of us, or 60%, um, of the total are independent according to the AFEP and MEDEF code. The board is composed of three committees, as usual an audit committee and a nomination and compensation committee and um, now we also have a CSR and governance committee. And you can see it here. Um, this CSR and governance committee, which I have the honor to chair, was created two years ago, and it is composed of four members today and its BIS highest CSR oversight body. Our main duty is to assess on behalf of the board of directors whether the breadth of social and environmental risk and opportunities are being properly dealt with by our company. And to do so, we are regularly presented with sustainability policies processes and with the results. We also analyze and discuss the ESG ratings and overall performance of the company on that. In 2020 and 21, we covered topics such as, for example, the results of the annual board evaluation, the board's competence matrix with an addition in 2020 of a CSR competence now, Governance topics raised by the proxy advisors, uh, investors or the AMF. The target um, for women in senior management positions. SPIES ethics program. The director's independence for sure. And the ESG rating reports and investor feedbacks on ESG. So a pretty busy again, agenda, I would say. And last year we met five times with a very high attendance rate of 96%. Beyond the board of directors, I can say that sustainability governance is ensured at all levels of space organization from the top to the grassroots level. Starting from the top, the president and CEO of course, but also his entire executive committee. And the executive committee has validated the CSR roadmap presented to you today, making sure that it would be practically adopted and followed through their respective subsidiaries and functions. They also review on a monthly basis key processes and performance related to health and safety and to employees' attraction and retention. Climate risk and opportunities has been very high on the XCOMS agenda as well in the last 18 months. Let me say um, a few words about competence. 
When I was approached to join um, Space Board back in 2014, my specific skill set and experience around human resources finally made the difference there. The board is assessed on its CSR competency and when a given competence is not even across the board or needs refreshing, our highest governance bodies train themselves. And this was the case last year, for instance, when the executive committee took a thorough two-day climate restraining delivered by the think tank so on part of the shift project. SPI has established a dedicated group CSR committee in 2017, whose mission is to propose strategic CSR orientation to the executive committee. And they have designed this um, CSR 2025 roadmap, which was presented to you earlier. Two members of the executive committee sponsor this committee, which is composed by the CSR heads from each subsidiary, as well as all key functions such as health and safety, CSR and HR. SB is a decentralized company. Each subsidiary has formed its own CSR committee led by the head of the CSR in this given geography. And their mission is to adopt or adapt the group CSR roadmap, taking into account the specificities of their activity mix, their own risks in that area, and their own opportunities. And their objectives are formalized in the subsidiary's annual CSR action plan. As for the group committee, they also play the role of a kind of a one-stop shop to find on one hand the CSR expertise, but, other, uh, but on the other hand also to share back practices um, within the group. So having a clear sustainability governance at all levels of the organization is definitely one of SPI's strengths. But obviously in order to make it work the best possible, we need the right incentive structure. And starting with the CEO's variable compensation, the CSR criteria accounts up to 23% of the qualitative part of his variable pay this year. And this CSR part is determined based on two topics. Um, number one, the implementation of a roadmap on the reduction of CO2, as well as a reduction target for the year 2021. And second, the improvement of SPI's average ratings from the ESG rating agency like, we have seen that, Sustainalytics, MSCI, and Visheo. Then, um, the group's health and safety performance, which is a top priority for SPI since I know him and I think long before, is an important input for the quantitative portion as it is used as a weighting factor for the EBITDA organic growth. And I think that includes a very clear message, growth must never be achieved at the expense of health and safety. And now we are clearly looking to have the CSR criteria included in the incenting structure of a much wider base of managers. And here two major evolutions are currently envisaged. Number one, the inclusion of the CSR criterion in the 2022 long-term incentive plan, so about the performance shares, which has around 250 beneficiaries. So the board um, of director is currently working on it. And the other one is the inclusion of a CSR criterion in the XCOMS members variable compensation. And here again, work in progress but I think overall it's a major evolution which will reflect the strong commitment of our group's um, senior management to sustainability. And last but not least, I shall remind you that SPI all, that at SPI all managers and all supervisors' variable pay is partly determined based on the safety performance. Ethics and compliance are key to a company like SPI which operates on such an international, people-intense, client focus and decentralized business. The group has a comprehensive ethics code, which has been recently overhauled, and it will be published in the very near future. And this new version updates and expands the previous one, 
while keeping at, at its heart the group's core values, and this is performance, proximity, and responsibility. Now, in the new version, more emphasis is made on certain topics, as for example, human rights, anti-corruption, or conflicts of interest. And a guide to this ethics code is made available to the SPIES employees, and it contains for each topic recommendations in the form of do's and don'ts. And it also contains a group rules related to anti-corruption risk, especially such as gifts, invitations, sponsoring and donations. The possibilities um, to report infringements to ethical rules have been expanded with a revised whistleblowing system to become effective at the end of this month. And this whistleblowing system is open to SPIES employees as well as to any external workers and any other stakeholder as long as it's a physical person and not just a legal body. It will be possible to make reports even anonymously on a dedicated platform which site is secure and managed by an external service provider that is bound by a strict duty of confidentiality. And these alerts will be received and dealt with by the group's compliance officer. So events that may be reported are in particular any misdemeanor or crime, violation of law, or regulations, violation of ethic code, and any serious threat or harm to the general interest. For example, a report may cover violations of anti-corruption law, competition law, banking law, security laws, and accounting laws. And events likely to constitute internal or external fraud, safety risk, misuse of corporate assets, embezzlement of these assets, insider training or a conflict of interest. And also elements potentially being case of a psychological or a sexual harassment can be reported by the person considering to be subject to such a situation. So in the meantime, it is for sure still possible and it will be also possible in the future to address written alerts to various persons within SPIES organization like for sure their compliance officer, all the HR people and um, the employer representative. With that, I would like to come to a conclusion. Sustainability is strongly embedded in SPIES governance with a clear accountability on all levels of the organization, an evolving appropriate incentive structure and strong ethics and compliance. And as the chair of the Board of Directors CSR Committee, I am deeply convinced that SPI is pursuing an ambitious and consistent sustainability strategy that resonates very well with the nature of the group's services, as well as with the values and also with the commitments of his 45,000 employees. And with that, I would like um, to hand over to Mr. Gauthier Loet for the closing remarks. Thank you for listening. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Regina, and, uh, and thank you also for, for supporting us at uh, you know, being a, a board member since two, 2014, and you, you have brought a, a lot of, uh, of value to the board, and uh, and you have really helped us uh, grow o o over these years and, and keep focused on important topics like like CSR. Um, so, so thanks to all of you for for um, attending today. Um, clearly, uh, we try to first give you a, a concrete view of uh, uh, what we do in terms of uh, energy transition and, and the vast uh, array of opportunities this uh, topic offers. But also I hope that we have uh, conveyed to you the sincerity uh, of our uh, commitment in this regard. I think that's something that is, is really important to us, that really matters. It's also very important to our employees. It gives them a sense of what they do 
in in uh, in uh, helping uh, protect uh, the planet and and fight climate change it's also very important to to attract and keep young people and the thing that is with these young people in mind that we keep working on all this uh, green economy commitment so, so thanks for 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 your attention we we have a, a lot to do i think a, a lot of uh, runway in front of us uh, many opportunities it's a good time to be an electrical engineer and it's a very good time to be really a part of the solution in terms of green economy thanks a lot have a good day okay <clears throat> now we have a second q a session um, so again, if you want to raise questions in the room, please raise your hand and then we'll take questions on the platform. So we start with Nicolas. Thank you very much. Uh, Nicolas Tabor from Stiefel. Um, my first question would be on the scope three targets where you expect to have, I think, 67% of the procurement uh, with suppliers with ambitious CO2 targets. Um, how do you define that and how do you manage that? I think. The scope three is like 80% of your emissions, right? Uh, as most companies. Um, and then in terms of the 25% reduction target uh, for greenhouse gas in scope one and two, um, is it in terms of intensity or is it just in tones? So even if you achieve faster growth on top line, you'll still achieve minus 25%. And then maybe coming, up, coming back to the previous discussions uh, uh, this afternoon, um, how much of your contracts in industry and, uh, and building tech FM all have, uh, let's say, uh, indexation on energy efficiency targets. What's the percentage that include these kind of targets that you can then value and show to, to the auditors for taxonomy and so on? Do you have an idea? Thank you very much. Thank you. So um, first on scope one and two, the minus 25% are in absolute targets, not uh, intensity targets. So indeed, uh, we, we grow <laughs> this year. Uh, the, the acquisitions that have been made already uh, this year, uh, they, they would add about 3.5% to our scope one and two footprint. So Indeed, what we will have realized in 2025 is much more than minus 25%. On scope three, um, how will we be achieving this? So uh, it gives me the opportunity to highlight again uh, that our target is on 67% of the spent by emissions. And so not of the spent by euro, so that means that uh, we will be engaging uh, very heavily uh, with our largest uh, suppliers by emissions, which are uh, those supplying us with uh, cables, uh, CVC equipment, IT. So some of them are already committed, engaged. This is particularly the case in the IT business. Some our largest supplier there, Cisco, uh, has had its science-based targets validated for a while. But uh, we have a large number, and this is where it gets interesting, uh, we have a large number of medium-sized medium uh, suppliers, which today have a low, uh, let's say, a low carbon footprint reduction maturity. And so it is, our, it is our job also in consortium with other, with other um, companies, with peers, uh, to, to bring them towards setting uh, science-based targets themselves. And for the last question, uh, so how, what's the percentage of industry and buildings which already have uh, energy performance contracting that was was that your question oh <laughs> maybe maybe some help from from marius or no olivier marcus or olivier on this thing yeah? who wants to be first um, maybe uh, olivier yeah? for me the situation in france is quite different because on the building uh, part it's true that most of our contracts include uh, energy saving uh, 
elements. So I would say between um, 60 to 80 percent of our facility management and uh, uh, contract include this kind of, uh, of position and, and commitment by SPI. Uh, at the contrary, in the industry part, it's true that uh, industrial are very interested globally in the CSR approach and mainly on energy saving, but the solution are still to be defined. We talked about a few ones like uh, hydrogen, for example, like a solar panel and things like that, but uh, we are working with them on solution and the, their involvement for the moment is rather on finding solution rather than implementing them. So it will take a little more time in industry, but the real, the real focus of our client on this topic, nevertheless. Marcus, you want to add something? I tend to say that um, um, with looking at the tech FM and energy efficiency business in Germany, we have, um, well, the subsidiary which is purely focusing on um, energy saving matters, yeah, and that is energy solutions, and that is making up 10% of the tech FM business. Uh, plus, as Olivier said, we are um, having a lot of larger clients where we are um, forced to make energy saving proposals. The implementation is then for the client, so I tend to say that um, 10 to 20 percent of our um, contracts are already having such um, uh, things in our contractual base, and this is um, enlarging now. We have a question on organic growth. Uh, could you quantify a bit more the organic growth you expect for the wool group? with increased growth in renovation, lighting, energy efficiency, and all new very strong growth business you alluded to, is 5% a good guesstimate? Well, I, I think we, we have uh, indicated what, what, what we are seeing as, a, as, a, as a, uh, incremental uh, growth stemming for, from all these uh, drivers. Uh, you know, 5% is a, is a is, is quite a, a strong uh, figure in our business. We did achieve 5% growth in, in France in, in 2019, or we, we achieved in some areas in Germany, like uh, distribution, we achieved 6% uh, growth uh, last year. But uh, I would call it top of the range. Um, we have a follow-up question on the scope three uh, commitment. How do you assess the ambitious aspects of suppliers' commitments? An excellent question. It depends uh, on their on their size, of course, and so uh, we do not have yet the full-fledged answers. We have uh, transverse uh, expert teams in procurement, in operations, working on that, but we cannot have the same level of expectation uh, for a large company than towards a, a small or medium-sized company. So to cut it short, uh, a small and medium-sized company, we would be asking uh, for them to reduce their direct emissions, scope one and two, whereas for a large company, uh, we, would take, um, we would take other proxies, uh, including a commitment to reduce their scope three emissions. Um, with the price of CO2 skyrocketing, are your clients ready to pay higher prices for your services, considering the savings they generate on CO2 contracts? Maybe, Oliver, you want to, to give a, an answer from what, what you see in, the, in your business in the Netherlands? Well, well we, we, don't, we don't see the prices rocketing yet related to CO2 emissions. Um, so, not, not related to that, but we do see, for example, uh, prices more related to the infrastructure, like uh, Tenet and Rijkswaterstaat, who is the governmental agency. Um, they are willing to, pray, to price add-ons for um, uh, faster uh, delivery of services. So they have a huge challenge laying in front of them, and they are looking for companies like us who can help speed up, and that is being rewarded in pricing. Um, any colors on the planned stimulus packages in other European countries than France and Germany? Uh, and can the plus 0.5% to 1.5% organic growth boost double on the back of the letters? 
Well, may maybe just uh, leave you on to, to talk about the, the plans in the Netherlands, and especially towards uh, uh, hydrogen. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, I think like in many other countries, also the Netherlands, uh, boosts an in interesting uh, hydrogen stimulus plan. We're talking about the northern region, which want to position themselves as uh, the, the European hydrogen valley. Um, they're talking about 9 billion euros of investments to be done uh, in, the, in the short future. Together with that, you see uh, intensive um, science programs, programs uh, arising, collaboration between German universities and uh, Dutch universities, and uh, the Dutch government stimulating all types of, um, of yeah, science-based projects to um, create more knowledge on the field of hydrogen, specifically related to the business case. Like I said in our introduction, um, to really scale it up, you need an attractive business case. And today it's a bit who is going to take the responsibility in the chain. And so for that, you need a more scientific based uh, 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 platform to capture technologies, but also to capture how to create this business case and hence how to stimulate these investments. Um, so uh, we see a strong lobby, we see investment money, we see a program, we see science. So everything is set uh, for what we believe to going to be a really interesting market in the future. And, and with regard to growth with um, uh, Marcus, Olivier and Liv, today you have 75% uh, of our business. And so it gives you s some idea about uh, our growth opportunities. Okay, we have another question from the web. Anyone in the room? Nicola? Just the last one, if I may. Um, by when would you expect to update all these targets, ambitious targets, if ever the Equans deal was to fall on in your hand and you were cl to close it? Is it already something you look at in terms of, I don't know, accident rate, which is at the heart of the uh, incentive of every employee at SP, and I think that's something you, you will have to, to, to put in the same, um, to, to implement at Equance as well? Is it something you already think of, or maybe it's too early? I, w I was surprised that we had reached uh, that point of the meeting without a question about uh, Equance. <laughs> uh, but uh, thank you, Nicola. No, I think, um, well, clearly, uh, as Isabel has mentioned, uh, we are we as a forerunner in terms of uh, using the EU uh, taxonomy. We're also a loan runner, and nobody else has done it. And so, uh, clearly, when, when we look at uh, Econ's business, uh, it's not that different from what we do. Huh? We, we're in the same pond, huh? and uh, so we do not expect, uh, uh, if, they were, uh, if we were to calculate uh, the, the um, uh, green share, we would not expect something radically different from where we are at SPI. Huh? But clearly, if we were to be successful in this deal, uh, th that would be uh, an area of, of big interest to, to better understand and understand fast and be able to, to report fast on, the, on these issues. As I said, and what doesn't get measured doesn't get managed. And if we want to grow uh, our green share, it has to be measured from day one. We've got uh, another question from the web. Um, with the acceleration of your end markets and the positive impact on top line organic growth, do you expect positive impact on margins as well? Well, that's a question for, from my AMDs. Uh, thanks, for, <laughs> thanks for asking. Um, I think the, um, our margins are going to, to progress further. We, we have, uh, we, this year, 2021, we will be back at, uh, at a 6% margin, which was pre-COVID. Huh? And uh, looking forward, we, we really plan to, to um, to, to move up for, from this level. I indicated that uh, our, our short-term goal, uh, which again is shared with my uh, colleagues and from the XCOM, is to, to, to be in more, more in the 6.5% uh, level and not too distant the future. So that will conclude our Q&A session. Yeah, well, in that case, uh, thank, thanks a lot. I hope that uh, that's also those of you attending per, per video got a, a good impression of, uh, of our commitment in this regard. Thanks to, uh, for, for everyone who has 
taken part in, in preparing the, the, this meeting, uh, and especially to, to our colleagues from the XCOM, including, including obviously uh, Jerome, uh, who have been um, uh, very dedicated to, to prepare for this uh, event. So thanks a lot. Have a good day.